Joining us now, our regular Wednesday NHL insider from TSN and the Rain Drags Hockey Podcast, it's Darren Drager joining us once again. Drags, how are you? Ah, I'm doing okay. I mean, lots of stuff percolating around the National <laughs> Hockey League, as you guys know. And yeah. yeah, we're all looking forward to the conference finals, so it's a good time of year. I mean, uh, the hockey, in some respects, just in the last 24 hours, has sort of taken a back seat. There's, <laughs> there's been a lot of news, and I think we have to start with the possible relocation of a franchise because that took about 20 minutes from the knowledge that the vote was not going to go the Coyotes' way for people to go, no. okay, enough. So yeah. the, the general public, Dregs, is, is completely on board with enough is enough. Yeah. Do do we really think Gary Bettman will finally say this is a failure? No, not yet. Um, but, you know, I think the league has to be in a position where they recognize that they're out of options there. Um, but there are still some local options that they want to continue to consider. Um, you know, as I mentioned on TSN.ca earlier this morning, you know, you look at the Phoenix Suns, new ownership there. You know, is that individual willing to consider... Uh, renovating the building again at considerable expense, maybe partnering with the Arizona Coyotes to get involved in a new building, which doesn't necessarily make sense. But I'm told that that's a better option than bringing uh, the Arizona Coyotes into the facility that the Suns play in that was just fully renovated. And I was also told that uh, the owner of the Suns likely isn't willing to consider buying the Arizona Coyotes. So that would be the local connection that at least makes some sense, that I think that the NHL and Commissioner Bettman are going to continue to work on and uh, maybe try and convince ownership of the Suns uh, to, to at least consider that moving forward. Beyond that, you're right. I mean, the league has to consider, has to consider relocation right now. And this is where it gets spicy because... You're going to have the, the Canadian audience and the Quebec faithful who think that, well, Quebec has to be high on the list of consideration. I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, the fine people of Quebec would absolutely support the Arizona Coyotes and they have the facility there and on and on and on it goes. Uh, maybe, but I don't know that the league is looking <clears throat> to bolster the Canadian market to eight. Uh, what they know is that, you know, they've got Ryan Smith who's owner of the Utah Jazz, who has publicly declared yeah. that he does want to uh, bring an NHL franchise to Salt Lake City. You know, how much sense does that make? Because if you go that route, and let's call Salt Lake City a front runner at this point for relocation, that opens up the possibility of expansion down the road, big, big dollars, big dollars, with Houston, uh, Atlanta, maybe Kansas City sitting in the wings there. Again, that's down the path. But that does not solve the wants and needs of those in Quebec. Yeah, Houston and Salt Lake, you know, for the sake of, you know, not having to rejuggle conferences and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, those yeah. seem like the easiest uh, to go. Heck, you could probably even keep yeah. the same name if you went up to to Salt Lake and the uh, the Jazz. Big problem mm -hmm. there is no building, right? They, yeah. they, they're, they're due for a building. Jazz need a new building too, which is good. I mean, the, at least the owner would know he's got two tenants and yeah. you like to fill up your building, but that would be a few years away. They'd have to play in uh, maybe the Utah Grizzlies arena first. Maybe. It has 10,000 10, seats, which is better than bigger than Mullet. Yeah, but let, let me just share this, fellas. Uh, you know, none of this would have come as a surprise to Batman or maybe even the Arizona Coyotes. They mm. knew and they've known for the past month as things were developing in Tempe that this was going to be a real slippery vote and right. it was going to be super close. And that's what it ended up being. So in, in saying that, Batman is always in tune with the interests of those outside the National Hockey League that may want to get inside the National Hockey League. So we know he's had conversations with Ryan Smith, again, with the Utah Jazz. Um, and I'm sure he's talked with every prospective buyer uh, that there is. And then you look at the Ottawa situation, like there's only one bidder that is going to end up with the Ottawa Senators, right? And then there have been a number of guys who and groups who have been willing to throw upwards of a billion dollars Canadian to buy the Sens. You know, maybe one of one of those groups just wants to be an NHL owner. So the possibilities of, of what they might do with the Arizona Coyotes are, are pretty significant, but they're still committed to exhausting the local possibility first. 
So, Dregs, what does this mean for a timeline then? Like, are, are we anticipating that there will be at least one more season in mullet, a lame duck season in mullet? Or can, like, I mean, you got to put schedules together and those types of things. Usually the schedule's released around the draft for next season. Remember how quick Atlanta to Winnipeg happened, though? Like, that was quick. Yeah. yeah, it was quick. It was end of May, too, right? Yeah. When when that happened, sorry, my dog is going bananas here. <laughs> and I stupidly have the door open a little bit on he's the He's heard home all the coyotes studio. talk. And he's <laughs> yeah, to get maybe in. that's what it was. Well, what it is is I've got some people working in the yard here putting a sprinkler system in. So Tiny the Great Dane is perusing and, and going around the perimeter of the house and seeing yeah. these guys, and she wants out to play. So um, timeline, Jeff, uh, yeah, I mean, sooner rather than later. But, you know, even if they had had the building uh, approved, you know, how, you don't just snap your fingers, obviously, and get a, an NHL facility, a multi-purpose facility built in a year or two. So I, I think that they're okay with going back to mullet. Um, maybe the bigger concern should be, though, like it's, it's, it's not like, you know, they have had a windfall of people lining up to get into the 4,500 square, 4,500 uh, uh, no. 4, seat facility. So if you're thinking of, of expanding and building that facility in Arizona, period, you know, are you sure you're going to command 15, 16,000 fans on a regular basis? So this might be more of a test study and a bigger experiment for Bettman and company. So I think that uh, they don't have a huge issue with playing another year just as it plays out to buy them some time. I know your colleague Pierre Lebrun reported earlier in the week that uh, things are picking up on the Pittsburgh front, and they've got a couple of positions to fill in the front office, obviously, after the house cleaning there. Awesome, familiar names, certainly. Blast yeah. from the past, if you will. Uh, Mark Bergeron, uh, Peter Shirelli, yeah. uh, apparently in the mix there as well. Yeah, and, and you know, I don't think that we should be surprised by that. I mean, Mark Bergevin, for the most part, was a, was a good NHL general manager with the Montreal Canadiens. He certainly had longevity there. So he goes to the LA Kings to work with Rob Blake, but that was just to buy time and keep himself active and involved in, in the everyday NHL lifestyle. Um, likewise for Peter Shirelli. I mean, Oilers fans may not want to hear this, but before he landed in Edmonton, Pete Chiarelli was regarded, highly regarded, as a general manager. So he deserves another crack, in my opinion. So you've got two very veteran, experienced uh, individuals there. I've heard Jason Carmanos from the Buffalo Sabres. I mean, this guy has been heavily involved in winning three Stanley Cups in management groups. So it's a bit of a surprise to me why he has never landed in a GM chair. So he should get ample consideration. John Chica's name has been out there. I mean, go down the list. I mean, the Fenway Group, let's give them credit. That's the ownership of, of the the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're doing their due diligence, and they're making sure that uh, they're, they're basically talking to everyone. It wouldn't surprise me, though, if one of those three guys, be it Shirelli, uh, Mark Bergevin or John Chayka get a real good look. If if not as general manager, maybe president of hockey operations, something along those lines. And and why no true living? Why did the Flames say no there? I don't know. That one is a weird one, right? Like it's not like the NHL doesn't have enough going on. But again, I guess it's an independent contract with the Calgary Flames, and it's the Calgary Flames that are saying no. Yeah, they're not a allowing him to interview. I think that's small-time nonsense, in my opinion. It really is. Do we honestly think that Brad Trilliving isn't going to, to be somewhere next season? I mean, he's not looking for a full recharge here. You know, he, he pushed away from the Calgary Flames because <clears throat> they weren't willing to make the necessary changes that are required. And then they fired Daryl Sutter. If Daryl Sutter had been fired or Trilliving was allowed to go in a different coaching direction, he'd still be with you the think? Calgary Flames. Yeah. So it it is... It's it's a bizarre one. It's a bizarre one to hold on to his contract until the end of June because there's no doubt that the team's looking for a GM Pittsburgh. Who knows? Maybe Toronto. They'd be keenly interested in Brad Trey Living. My conspiracy theory on this, Darren, do you think that when they decided, okay, we, we will fire Daryl, do you think they broke off a call to Brad and said, will you come back? And Brad said no, and they're mad about that? <laughs> I don't think so, but, I mean, it kind of fits. Doesn't it? Um, a, I mean, he was still in the contract. There, you're yeah. right. He'd still be there. Like they yeah, weren't yeah. planning necessarily to fire him. That's, anyway, that's where my mind went, as I'm saying. Um, because otherwise, it. why would you deny it, right? Well, so. and look, I I know that ownership of the Flames 
had engaged with Trey Living on, on a couple of occasions long before the decision was made for him to break away, mm-hmm. right? Um, and good on him. Credit the integrity of Brad Trey Living. He just drew the line in the sand and said, look, you know, if your loyalty as ownership is to Daryl um, and not embracing the changes, then this go. just isn't going to work out. Yeah. But, you know, in fairness to ownership too, I you know, what, Sutter has two years and probably eight plus million dollars Canadian owing to him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that ownership group has deep pockets, but nobody wants to just kiss away that amount of money. So this was, uh, it was a delicate one. But to your point, and the point well made, Blake, if he were free to talk to Pittsburgh or any team in the market for a GM, he'd be high on the list. Dregs, dust still settling in your neck of the woods uh, in Toronto after yeah. the early ouster. Uh, I say early ouster, I guess this year. It was a late ouster for the Leafs yeah, after that first was. round. But, but some really curious comments from Kyle Dubas uh, talking about the toll that uh, his yeah. job has taken on his family. Uh, the fact that he doesn't want to go anywhere else, that it's sort of the Leafs yeah. or nowhere for him. So where does that leave him in the hockey club? Well, good question. And unfortunately, the brass of the Toronto Maple Leafs don't know that. You know, they're simply waiting for Kyle Dubas to come forward with an indication of the direction that he wants to go. But it kind of puts them, again, Brendan Shanahan and above in a tough situation, doesn't it? You know, I think that they were surprised by his approach with the media availability there. You know, I think that they thought he was going to say, I want to stay in Toronto. That's that's my goal. You know, we've got to get through a, a contract negotiation, but I want to stay general manager of the Maple Leafs. He said that. But then he added that, and if it's not Toronto, then chances are I'm going to go on a break and I'm going to recalibrate. So I have to have a long conversation with my family to prioritize what we should do here moving forward. I, I don't believe that the brass of the Maple Leafs expected him to say that. So they heard it for the first time along with the rest of us. And, and so now I've had time to digest this. There are some things that come to mind here, Right. Um, And I think of the Tampa series where Kyle Dubas is arguing with the fans, right? Now, you know, the management box is in close proximity to, you know, the the fan base there. And apparently they were heckling Morgan, Riley, and and Dubas wanted to defend his star defenseman, all of that. Okay, it's a bit out of character. He's feisty, but he knows he's always on camera. And then you saw the water uh, bottle throw, right? So I think this man was under incredible pressure. And I think that's why he made the declaration in the way that he did. Uh, But the Maple Leafs have an organization to run here. They cannot wait for several days, a couple of weeks. They can't. They just flat out can't. So I think as we creep later into the week here, if Dubas doesn't come forward, I think Shanahan's got to call it and just say, okay, you're in or you're out. You're in or you're out. And maybe the writing is on the wall that he can't be 100% in, mm-hmm. given what he said at that media availability. It was stunning, if not bizarre, that media avail. Speaking of Maple Leaf employees, uh, my ba- Mike Babcock is kind I of still that. one of those. Yes. Um, and his r- name is surfacing as a guy who's already one of yeah. three people that's interviewed with the Columbus Blue Jackets. It's according to Aaron Portline and, and The Athletic. Yeah. Um, I-, I was of the mind, this was just my own opinion, I picture because he's he's universally respected and i think people like him as a person more despite some follies i think i thought joel quenville would be the guy that that gets lily white before or at least closer to white um to get back in the league than mike babcock yeah um but here we are maybe it's mike babcock well it could be as portsline reported uh i mean he has interviewed for the vacancy in columbus along with uh peter laviolette formerly of the washington capitals and pascal vincent who is internal and Pascal Vincent is, is going to be a good NHL coach. He's just waiting for the opportunity. And if that's not in Columbus, then maybe it's somewhere else or coaching vacancies that need to be explored. Um, Columbus makes sense for Babcock here, guys. We know he's under contract with the Maple Leafs for another year. So he's getting paid handsomely to hunt, to fish, to do all the things that Mike Babcock loves to do. Uh, but what burns in his belly is coaching in the National Hockey League. Um, I'm going to talk about Joel Quenville here as well because you linked them together to some degree, Blake. I'm also very surprised. The word out there is that the NHL has basically said to Q um, or those around him, yeah, you know what, we're, we're just not ready to approve your reinstatement until summer, July, August. 
Well, if that's the case, then that takes all of these guys likely out of the mix. Right. He he should have been a good fit for the New York Rangers after firing Gerard Gallant. Yet a day or two later, Larry Brooks from the New York Post says that Joel Quindle isn't an option for the Rangers. That's head-scratching to me. Um, Babcock, I think, would be or could be a candidate for the New York Rangers. I think he'd prefer a smaller market club like Columbus over a medium market that can get turn into mayhem like it does in New York. So I think his experience with Toronto is going to streamline him to a club where he feels he's not only a fit and can win, and Columbus isn't that far away, I don't think, right? Um, but also a market where if he's not able to manage the media, <laughs> which he likes to do, mm -hmm. then he can at least deal with a smaller presence of media. So it makes sense. Well, let's just finish up with the current collection of coaches that are still alive in the National Hockey League. It's an interesting crop to me. Fantastic. In as much as you've yeah. got two guys that are going up against franchises that they used to coach and Paul Maurice going back yeah. against Carolina and Pete DeBoer. <laughs> I mean, how rich is that storyline? Leaves Vegas and is now uh, in a collision course with Vegas, uh, you know, yeah. with a chance to, to go to the Stanley Cup final. Of course, Bruce Cassidy, I think he's proven that uh, he is one of the top coaches uh, the last 10 years or so. Yeah. And then you've got Rod Brindamore, who's just got such buy-in there in Carolina. So uh, for me, the coaching storylines here, uh, and maybe the star power in these final four say, is, is behind the benches. Say. Yeah. Yeah, you know what we should do is take a tally of the coaching salaries among that group because, <laughs> you know, Pete DeBoer is going to be up there and you know that Bruce Cassidy is getting paid handsomely in Vegas. Paul Maurice likely did okay in Florida. And maybe the low man on the totem pole might be the best of the lot, and that's Rod Brindamore with the Carolina Hurricanes. Who, You know, it's because that the Hurricanes ownership there in Tom Dunnan is just stingy when it comes to paying people. But this is a master class of head coaching. It really truly is. And look, I mean, at the end of the day, we know that the players matter most. They're the ones that execute and, and play the game on the ice. But I don't think that it's a coincidence that you've got this cast of four top level coaches with their clubs in the conference finals. I don't, it's, it's not a coincidence. Coaching matters. And it is going to be fierce and it is going to be awesome, you know, to 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 watch the likes of Brenda Moore versus Paul Maurice, long history then there. And then obviously, you know, Pete DeBoer versus Bruce Cassidy. Those two coaches in the Western Conference final, every coach preaches defense because you can't win without it. But those two guys are magician when it comes to the structure and how their teams play. So it's gonna be interesting to see how they play matchups here. May the 17th, and uh, honestly, we didn't even get to any of the peripheral Canuck news or anything. Meat Pretty on quiet. the bone. Uh, yeah. Meat on the bone, though, league-wide yeah. for, for news. Uh, who'd have thought? Drags, thanks as usual. Be hey, good. guys, thank you.